Hello, everybody. Welcome to this week's episode of the Montpelier Happy Hour here on WVEW 107.7 LP Prattleboro, your community radio station. I'm your host, Olga Peters, and this is the show where we talk about how everything in Montpelier shakes out for the rest of us. And we're having a little bit of a Wyndham County reunion today. Because not only is regular contributor Emily Kornheiser, one of three reps from Brattleboro, on today's meeting, but also Chad Simmons, who's a former Brattleboro resident, which is where I first met Chad. Um, and he is now the housing policy and engagement specialist for the Vermont Housing Finance Agency. And he is based in um, Montpelier now. So, hey, Chad, it's good to see you. It's great to see you as well, and happy to be back in this virtual Wyndham County space. <laughs> <laughs> well, today um, we're going to be talking about S-100, which is a bill, um, it has come from the Senate, it is now with the House General and Housing Committee, and it's looking at ways of increasing housing in Vermont, and, and also our land use policies in Vermont, and how those two things work together. And I'm, I would love to hear from Chad and Emily before we really dive into the bill. You know, as I was reading through the bill, um, I think Chad referred to it as a very wonky piece of legislation, which he is so right. Uh, but it made me think how in Vermont, we tend to have this, this concept that you can either have housing or you can have pretty landscapes. You can't have both. Uh, and yet we are wrestling right now in Vermont with land use and with a lack of housing. And so we kind of need both. And I would just love to hear from Emily and Chad, just kind of your response and your thoughts on, on that, that Vermont story. Yeah, it's really interesting that you name that paradigm because actually Vermont's, some of the really, really incredible work that Vermont has done on housing and conservation has been built on this like grand bargain of the Vermont Housing and Conservation Board, which is a single organization that is actually tasked with thinking about both simultaneously. And so I think for a very long time, we've actually prided ourselves on balancing those two pieces and, you know, a real focus on our downtown and village centers for housing and then, you know, conservation in the rest of it. Um, and legislatively, I think usually we handle those two issues slightly separately. And I think one of the reasons things have gotten a little sizzly um, in the state house is because this particular bill was really sort of an omnibus bill that tried to tackle both simultaneously. Mm. And in doing that, um, had to spend time in both the Senate's housing committee, which is their um, economic development committee and their um, conservation committee, which is called their natural resources committee. And then over in the house is going to spend time in our house housing committee, house general, and in our um, climate and natural resources committee, which is called environment and energy. Um, and so, I think really because of almost like the nature of the way this bill was put together, it really highlighted the friction between those two ideas mm. rather than highlighting the opportunities between those two ideas. And I'm really um, perhaps like super looking for, looking like really hard for shining lights right now. But, you know, Brattleboro just got named the strongest town in America award. And I was like, of course, we're all around the strongest town in America. We're, we're like the best place ever. Um, and I think we're a lot to come out the other side. But in looking a little deeper on like what made us the strongest town in America, I realized the reason Sue Fillion was leading the charge was because it's like actually all zoning stuff. Like, I don't know why the guidelines to become the strongest town are all about zoning. Um, and I say that to say that they are, they, the two things are absolutely not in opposition to each other um, or don't have to be in opposition to each other. And I think it's actually just um, some bad communication on some of our parts that they keep on getting pitted against each other. But Great. we can Thank see you. how that goes. How about for you, Chad? 
Yeah, no, I think I think those are some great points and really glad Emily brought up the the committee structure because I think that's definitely playing a big part in the in the narrative as it's playing out in kind of the media and conversations across the state. I think the two words that I've heard quite frequently um, uttered in the state house are existential and spicy. Um, <laughs> and I think it this is been kind of a, an existential um, uh, exercise for the state to figure out how do we meet some of these gargantuan needs that we have as a state for um, our housing um, and, and to, house pe to house humans, um, but also to maintain kind of the ethos of Vermont, our connection with the land um, and and kind of the, this right that we have to clean, clean air, clean water. Um, and so um, I've definitely like just personally, it's been kind of an interesting um, space for me to be in as someone who identifies as an environmental organizer, as well as someone who's been um, now in the housing world for a couple of years and feel that 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 rub. I think um, I say the word spicy because I do feel like it's been um, somewhat artificially pitted against one another. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and, um, I wouldn't, I, I would kind of characterize it as unfortunate that we're looking at it as kind of an either or, and rather like, um, as, as, uh, Emily had mentioned, like the state has a really deep history of conservation, um, access to the land, protecting the land, um, connection to the land, as well as how do we ensure that folks needs are met. And I think that's what S100, uh, you know, the, the session's major housing bill is attempting to do is really ensure that we're, we've got pathways to build more housing, preserve more housing, but also do it in a way that we've identified as here's the housing, you know, values and priorities and development priorities that we've created. I think the last thing I'll say is, um, you know, I think it's really um uh, raised some questions on how we as, uh, uh, you know, as uh, governmental entities wrestle with these questions, mm -hmm. right, is like right now, I think some of the biggest um, frustrations have been around the um, purview that each of the committees has and which part of the bill the committees uh, gets to tackle. And um, I think that's kind of made it like, well, we either have this pathway or this pathway, rather than talking about like, well, if we're talking about zoning, how do we then make sure that the zoning um, is meeting our climate needs, is meeting our workforce needs, is meeting our transportation needs. Um, and I'll put a pin in the transportation part of that too, as well as meeting our housing needs. So mm -hmm. I think the bill as as like an, um, uh, 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 as a whole is trying to tackle all of those things. But I would venture to say that our, you know, our legislative structure and our committee structure and how state government is, is situated isn't quite, isn't quite able to meet all of those needs to, in, in a holistic approach. So I think those are some of the really interesting conversations. I think we're um, as I think collectively trying to figure out how do we meet as, you know, I'll get to in a minute, making 30 to 40,000 new housing units um, and doing so in a way that meets our environmental goals and our protecting our land. You know, we talked so much uh, in the show about how um, sort of the challenges in the committee structure for thinking systemically, um, mm -hmm. and just, just systems thinking in general, given the incredibly complex problems we have in front of us. And then there's also the role of the legislature and what is the role of the legislature in a lot of this. So, you know, when I talk to folks who are interested in building housing and are frustrated around um, sort of environmental concerns, it's almost always um, permitting, planning, zoning, permitting, right? And permitting is where Act 250 um, is basically blamed for all permitting problems. Yeah. In Vermont, yep. right? And um, and Wendy Harrison, our, Windham, our new Wyndham County Sen Senator, is quite um, eloquent about this. A huge number of our permitting things are actually federal rules that we have no control over at all, but be began after Act 250 and existed in Act 250, but could not be removed because they're federal. So 
that's something we can do nothing about, but is required, right? And then we have town level permitting and planning, right? That is very specific in Brattleboro, but say in Guilford doesn't exist. And so mm -hmm. there's a the question about like local control and what's best in that. And then there's the state level permitting, which happens in multiple departments. And the legislature can create the best legislation in the world, but unless the implementation of that legislation is A, solid, and we could I have more to say about that, and B, integrated with other levels of government, municipal permitting and federal permitting, it's going to be a nightmare for anyone who engages with it, regardless of how good the law is, right? Um, good point. And so on some level, we can do all we can, but unless the administration is interested in creating sort of streamlined systems that like fully serve government, right? That fully serve folks who are trying to get work done and environmental interests, um, I think no matter what reforms we put in place, other than completely stripping out all, you know, all rules whatsoever, we're going to be in a really hard spot. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, I'd love if we could put a, a pin in that, Emily, and, and maybe come back back to that. Um, but before we do, just to, to help listeners who maybe aren't familiar with S100. Oh, good idea. Um, just just give them some of the the highlights of the of the bill um when i went through it i saw a lot to do with municipal zoning i saw a lot to do with encouraging uh multi-unit or multi-family housing um some work around subdivisions um and some work around regional planning what what other highlights do you think we we should would help listeners well i um, I want Chad to answer this question, but I wonder if a good way to orient the answer or frame the answer might be there's sort of a certain level in the bill of sort of like raising all boats in terms of like mm -hmm. setting clear guidelines for every municipality's zoning, um, putting some sort of consistency there. And then there's sort of reforms the state is doing itself. Um, and then there's money being thrown into the pot for various things to make things better. And I feel like those are sort of three different pieces of the bill and some of them are zoning related and some of them are sort of new housing development related, but I feel like those are the, Chad, would those pots work for you as a way of describing the bill? Yeah, I think those are good pots. Yeah. Um, and maybe we can circle back to the why is this bill? Yeah, please so, do. Yeah, yeah. And um, so if you just take a minute to just talk about um, kind of where we're at in terms of needs. Some, so some of the work that VHFA does is really doing kind of analysis um, around uh, what are the housing needs across the state. We partner with a lot of the other housing organizations um, in the state, but also with the Department of Housing and Community Development to really look at where, you know, where we are now and where we're going. And so where we see ourselves needing to go is we need approximately 30 to 40,000 units of housing to be built by 2030. And that range is kind of looking at uh, a couple of different scenarios, but really looking at pre-pandemic, where were the housing needs moving forward? Um, what, where was our housing stock at? Uh, what was the rate of growth to be, um, to have a, he a healthy housing market? And then also kind of looking at um, the rate of growth during the pandemic. And we saw an increase of folks moving in, in migration to the state. And so that's a, a pretty significant um, component to why this bill is being needed. Another piece is the, the cost, the cost of housing. And I think to Emily's point that oftentimes Act 250 gets pointed to as the reason why, or another issue gets um, pointed to the market, gets pointed to as the reason why. I, you know, we would say that there's many reasons why we're in the place that we're at right now. And housing costs are being driven by materials, by labor, um, uh, but some uh, that analysis that we've done and by other national and statewide uh, research that's been done shows that permitting both at the municipal and state level contribute to the rising cost of housing. So our agency just um, did our uh, annual uh, low-income housing tax credit award this morning, 
And in those presentations, we talked about the per unit cost to build good, decent quality, um, affordable housing is nearing $500,000 per unit. Um, and so just to give a sense for folks like that, um, you know, a couple, just a couple of years ago, we were looking at high 300s. So the cost drivers have been um, uh, dramatic in the last several, several years. So this bill really tries to get at um, the number of units that we need to get online, as well as addressing some of the cost concerns. And by doing so, we're looking at local municipal zoning. So um, the bill really looks to tackle a couple of big um, uncertainties um, for developing housing. Um, and it also looks at, um, as the Senate uh, Committee um, on Economic Development, Housing and General Affairs, they really focused on the book. Um, uh, um, oh my gosh, it's right here. The Color of Law. The Color of Law. The color of law is kind of understanding like what made um, makes it so hard to build inclusive, diverse communities uh, and what makes it so expensive. And so I think looking at municipal uh, drivers of cost uh, exclusionary zoning um, was a major factor of the first part of the bill. And that really looked at um, doing duplexing by right, meaning if there is, um, if a community is zoned for single family housing, will now say that there at least has to be duplexes, so two units. We're looking at places that have um, that are zoned for a water sewer uh, can now have multi-unit uh, dwellings up to four units. And so we're really looking to, as a state, encouraging municipalities to um, have at least a baseline for developing more housing. Um, we talked a little bit earlier about transportation. So this, this bill look, really looks at um, you can no longer require parking minimums um, uh, below um, two. So really looking at the, 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 the max um, it can be one. And so essentially you can't require more than one parking unit. And there's some uh, deviations so that some communities that are looking at, um, uh, they have might, might have, um, uh, they might have certain issues that they're dealing with can go up to 1.5. And if you're looking at multi-units, then you're looking at you're decreasing the number of cars and that cuts down on cost. And then we move to addressing some of the statewide. Uh, so which has been some of the more where some of more of the tension has come uh, looking at Act 250. And we're really looking, the, the bill's really only looking at a, a handful of changes to the Act 250 which is a massive piece of, of, of state policy looking to protect uh, water and land. And that's really looking at trying to um, increase the amount of units uh, that, that folks can develop uh, within certain parameters. Uh, so essentially right now, there's a provision called, and we can get more into the weeds later, um, but um, 10, 5, 5, 10 units in five years uh, in five miles. And so the bill looks to increase that 10 unit um, threshold to 25 units during a three-year period. And again, we can get more into that later, but the goal of that is to um, have statewide policy reflect the need to be able to build more units um, in communities that have um, gone through the process. Um, I think that, you know, speaking um, to the last part um, then, uh, or the, the programs. So in the last couple of years, we the state has invested um, and rightfully so, over $400 million to, in, towards housing. And I think our state has done a, an amazing job at looking at how we can strategically use those dollars. And the legislature and the governor have been great at thinking through how to do that. I think, to Emily's point, really looking at how we can be more effective in utilizing those dollars and how our programs can be more aligned. I think that's something that we still need to work on. But the programs in, in S100, um, as um, there was some one there, there's some just process that the legislature uses, but essentially kind of where it's at in the house right now, there's over $116 million worth of investments towards programming going towards uh, agencies like the Vermont Housing Conservation Board, some two programs, actually three programs towards uh, Vermont Housing Finance Agency, uh, as well as programs like Home Share um, and more programs, as Emily had talked about, some um, incentives for communities to do bylaw modernization. So I've talked a lot. I'm going to pause. That was all great, though. Yeah. That was all great. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for hitting those three buckets for us, yeah, yeah. Uh, Chad. 
Um, Emily, anything you wanted to fill in since you've been looking at the bill as a lawmaker? Um, no, I think that covers it. It's a really, you know, it's an interesting piece of our housing conundrum to think about what our more um, densely populated communities need mm -hmm. versus our less densely populated communities and how to sort of, um, how to balance those needs and good legislation. So, you know, in Brattleboro, the bill, even if it passed out sort of as introduced, would have a fairly small impact on Brattleboro itself, right? Yeah. Like there would be a little bit of ease in Act 250 in our downtown and there would be money, right? Um, but some of the changes um, that would impact the towns around Brattleboro, you know, you're less densely populated, but still village center towns would make housing development more affordable and perhaps easier there um, would make a really big difference by taking some of the, basically all of the housing burden for the whole county is sort of sitting on Brattleboro right now in a lot mm -hmm. of ways, right? Mm -hmm. um, and so it would ease off some of the pressure on Brattleboro if there was more housing available um, in our outlying towns. And so that's, I sometimes I'm like, people are like, the bill goes too far. I'm like, the bill doesn't do anything for my community. Leave me alone, the bill does not go far enough. Um, and I do see how like changes in our outlying areas will make a difference. And, you know, despite my like desperate, desperate, desperate desire to build more housing in Brattleboro and around Brattleboro, I, I want Vermont to stay beautiful and wild. And I want to still have farms 15 minutes from my house at, while I'm 15 minutes for like, I want that Vermont too. And I don't see, we would have to do a lot of changes to our zoning and our Act 250 rules to like destroy that piece of Vermont. I don't think anyone I don't know anyone that's talking about like, you know, pave in the parking lot, you know, pay whatever, what is it? What's the Joni Mitchell say? Pave paradise and put up a parking yeah, lot. Yeah, I don't think anyone's talking about that. Like, I don't, you know, that's not really on the table. Like I, there are a bajillion strip malls in Brattleboro already. They could certainly be knocked down for high rise apartments. And I think everything would be prettier, right? Um, so I think it's a, it's a funny. The planning office even has plans for if someone wanted to do that, how to make it mixed use yeah commercial and residential mixed yeah. use so on it's a road really and stuff. Like, yeah it's so funny how we've created this like either or paradigm for the whole thing when it all is just like a fairly easy integratable whole that I'm hopeful we can get through mm -hmm. um thank you so just checking in, we have about five minutes before we need to hear from some underwriters and the the bill is with uh, housing in general right now in the house. And then did I hear you say, where is it going next, Emily or so Chad? I think that housing in general is planning on voting it out on Tuesday. They voted it out of their committee on Thursday night. Thursday. Ah, okay, yeah. thank yeah. you. Yeah, and then That's it nice. went, um, it went to, so it's it's now going, it'll be referred to house and environment and energy next. So it's following a very similar trajectory that it did in the Senate. So it started, um, and we should back up. There was a, you know, essentially Representative Bongart um, from Manchester, um, really kind of convened a group, um, uh, and he sits on the Environment and um, and Energy Committee convened a group to really kind of look at this uh, over the summer and fall. And so a big part of this bill really came from that body of work. Um, there was an agreement that started in the Senate, started in Senate economic development, moved to natural resources. Once it passed out of the Senate, it'll, it, it's following the same trajectory in the House. Okay. And I know because we're at the beginning of a biennium, if it doesn't finish the, the circuit um, mm -hmm. this okay. session, it can go on to the, <laughs> go into the next. But do we think it will make it to the end of this session? I think there's pretty high intention around that happening. I think there's about four bills that people really are committed to getting across the finish line this session, and that's one of them. And have we gotten any noise from the administration about the governor's thoughts on, on this bill? 
I um, have no idea. There's it's so much. There's so much noise all the time. <laughs> the governor did hold a press conference before it passed out of the Senate, um, and it kind of just communicating the the need to really look at the Act 250 provisions. And mm -hmm. so, I think there is a desire, you know, at, to 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 really for the legislature to kind of wrestle with how much it goes. And I think to Emily's point, there's a lot of communities that are saying eh, this might not actually do a lot for our communities as it's structured right now. Um, and so I think it's looking at how much do we wanna do this year? Um, a big component of the bill, and I know we're about at time, but a big component of the bill, there is a study um, that will kind of set the stage for what uh, changes could, could actually be proposed next session. Um, so I, I think that's also part of like, how much do we wanna hold off on the Act 250 uh, components? But you know, some communities are like, we can't hold off. Mm -hmm. um, we, we really don't have that that time and space to be able to, to wait another thank year. Thank you. Thank you, Chad. Well, um, on that note, Emily, Chad, and I are going to take a break so uh, we can hear from some of our underwriters here on WVEW 107.7 LP Brattleboro, your community radio station. We'll be right back. Welcome back to the second half of the Montpelier Happy Hour here on WVEW 107.7 LP Brattleboro, your community radio station. If you're just joining us, I'm your host, Olga Peters, and I'm speaking with Representative Emily Kornheiser, as well as Chad Simmons, who is the Housing Policy and Engagement Specialist with the Vermont Housing Finance Agency. Glad you guys are both here. We're talking about S100, but before that, um, I'm going to remind folks that you can find the happy hour on WVEW 107.7 LP Brattleboro on Friday at 2 p.m. And then we are also rebroadcast at Wednesday at 8 a.m. And thanks to BCTV, you can find us on their channels as well as many of the peg stations around the state. And the pro podcast version you can find wherever you subscribe to your podcasts. And Emily, what are we, what are you going to remind listeners of? Olga, I thought you were going to do my part for a minute. I got sort of excited <laughs> about it. Oh, you did? It, it was a false no. alarm. <laughs> the views and opinions expressed here on the Montpelier Happy Hour are those of the host and the guests, respectively, and not the station, platform, employer, nor front. Well, I have to say, Emily, I always appreciate you do that because it's one of those things that actually bugs me because I think our listeners are smart enough to know that. And I know we have to do that because of, you know, rules and stuff, but it always, I'm like, our listeners are smart enough. We don't need to tell it. them that. I find it incredibly entertaining. So, <laughs> and I don't know if you know this, Olga, but Chad is a very regular happy hour listener so i think he's heard me you know spin my joyful little line a few too many times i am i'm a long time listener first time caller kind of a person <laughs> first time guest yes yeah <laughs> but now I've that you've been on once you line. know you're gonna have to come back it's just it's just that simple are you gonna <laughs> listen to this one that's the question I would not if I were you. I don't listen to their show because I'm not sure if I've ever done it when I've been recorded, but you know, there's always a first. Mm -hmm. I have listened to a couple of your episodes more than once. So just in full disclosure. <laughs> yeah. In other words, you're listening, you're like, did they really just say that? I don't believe they just <laughs> said that. <laughs> I have to go back and listen again. Um, I would love, Chad, since we are talking about S100, which is uh covering a lot of ground around uh, land use and housing and zoning. Um, I just would love us to remind listeners that this bill and some of these housing decisions aren't coming out of nowhere, that the state has had has done a lot of work over the years around preventing sprawl and how we wanna develop our downtown. So would you mind just reminding listeners of some of those goals? Sure. Yeah. So, I mean, our state has um, a number of planning goals that are really rest in a couple of different areas, but our Department of Housing and Community Development um, has, has several areas in which they support the planning and development of our communities. 
the state funds the regional planning commissions um, that are through uh, that are placed throughout the state and they serve kind of regional planning um, and coalescing of um, and supporting the bylaws for municipalities. But essentially, kind of broadly speaking, our state really has goals to um, support development of our housing and commercial um, needs within kind of traditional settlement patterns uh, across the state um, and looking at focusing the development in those areas. And I would say that our Department of Housing and Community Development does a phenomenal job supporting the communities. I'm sure you all, Emily, can speak to what Brattleboro um, has been able to access in terms of the incentives and supports through the designated programs, um, the state designation programs, there's five, um, which kind of really supports um, both private and public investments in communities um, to support housing um, and development. And then uh, we those are also in line with uh, our environmental goals, our development goals, and making sure that um, because we're placing more of an emphasis on, on supporting development in those communities, um, that we make sure then that the other parts are, are um, maintained for um, as Emily mentioned before, you know, agriculture, working lands, um, uh, recreation, um, as well as me making sure our natural resources are preserved. Um, so um, that's, um, and again, that speaks to, oh, go ahead. So one part that we don't talk about that um, another sort of area of importance for community society, our state goals in the context of this compact development that we don't talk about as much um, is public health. Mm, good point. And particularly in the case of older Vermonters and our aging demographic, but for all of us, right? Um, and Chad, you and I used to talk about this all the time when we, you know, worked yes. mm -hmm. in early childhood together, but like, you know, a densely settled community means a level of walkability and neighbor acknowledgement and all of these things that makes such a big difference for folks who want to age in place, folks who want their kids to be, you know, noticed by their neighbors, um, to be able to access recreation as part of your daily routine rather than as a special activity. Um, all of those things are really possible when we have settlements in our downtowns and village centers. It's a really, really important point. Yeah. And I think it speaks to, again, the need to make sure that state government is aligned that we're in a way that we're successful and effective in making sure that all of those pieces are health, uh, access to food, uh, transportation, um, and community are really uh, thought, um, thought, you know, there, there's thoughtfulness that goes into uh, where we invest those dollars, uh, especially public dollars um, that we're ensuring that folks are healthy and have access to those services and supports. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, there, you know, Chad, you're, you're part of the VHFA. And at the beginning of the show, Emily, you were mentioning the Vermont Housing and Conservation Board. Um, the VHFA is an agency that is not alone in the work it does that it was a federal designation so many states have them but um i want to hear about the vermont housing conservation board in a minute but let's stick with the vhfa let's just remind people kind of what it does as an agency and how it fits into this big vermont housing picture sure sure well i know uh watchers viewers listeners have all um have seen uh my uh our our executive director Maura collins has been on the show a number of times but the Vermont Housing Finance Agency, as you mentioned, um, uh, housing finance agencies are um, in all 50 states and territories. Um, we essentially kind of do a number of things, and each state is a little bit different. In Vermont, we um, administer the um, federal low-income housing tax credit. It's one of this country's, it's the biggest way in which we invest uh, publicly in um, in, in our housing uh, sectors, and um, that's through a public-private partnership uh, through tax credits. We also administer the state housing tax credit program, 
uh, which the legislature passed in, I believe, 2009. Um, and then we also, our agency does uh, a number of different uh, programs, mortgage programs, um, development programs, um, and we're really kind of expanding our work because of the nexus, as Emily had talked about, around health, around energy. Uh, we're doing a lot more work on investing in energy efficiency and ensuring that low and moderate income Vermonters have access to the tools to be able to share their homes are, are warm, comfortable, and affordable. Um, so we're we're kind of working in a number of different arenas um, it, to be able to ensure that the financing and and, and uh, communities have access to the financing to be able to do that. Thank you. And Emily, tell us a little bit more about the Vermont Housing Conservation Board. Okay, but I think Chad will do a better job of that than I will. So I'm going to let him do it. <laughs> oh, okay. Sure. I, I mean, uh, the, I was giving Chad a break in case he wanted one. But. <laughs> <laughs> you all have heard me talk so much. Um, sure. I mean, um, I think what I could say is Vermont is really uh, fortunate. Um, and we also have, um, there was a lot of foresight in looking at bringing the housing um, world together with conservation. So the Vermont Housing Conservation Board um, uh, was was created in a way to kind of hold those two truths together. Um, and how they're funded is really looking at ensuring that um, our, our natural environment is uh, conserved, protected, and invested in, in the same way that we would invest in, in buildings. Um, so uh, uh, they get their funding uh, through um, federal uh, means as well as through um, state um, property transfer taxes, one of the, the primary ways in which they're funded um, at the state level. And that meets their dual uh, mission, you know, meets the dual purpose of their, of their mission. Um, and it's a very unique model. Uh, I will say, I think, um, you know, many states have these things that are kind of siloed and have agencies that are siloed. And I've been really excited to be able to work with um, VHCB in, in uh, the investments and their thinking and how we approach uh, both our housing and conservation needs as a state. Um, and I think, you know, they're also looking at the nexus of uh, access to food, um, who has access to land. I think that's could be a whole other topic that I'd encourage you all to invite some of the, the work that they're doing with BIPOC-led, um, Black, Indigenous, and people of color-led organizations around land access. Um, they've been holding space for that um, and investing in, in the areas that um, are often seen as disparate. So they're doing a lot around agriculture, farm worker, and farmer housing. Um, so I could go on about the work that they do, but I think it's important to know that in the state, there's a broad range of organizations that are focused on housing and funding for housing, um, including the Department of Housing and Community Development and the Vermont State Housing Agent Authority as well. Thank you. Yeah, I think it's always nice to, to touch on things like that because it's easy when we're talking just about a bill to, to focus on, on, on that piece of legislation and not always see the bigger picture that it fits into. Um, which, as Emily and I have said on the show, quite often these big issues need more than one lever pulled at the same time to, to move things forward. Um, I have another question for Chad, Emily, but I want to just touch base and see if there's anything you want to add. No, I think this is... Um... I think it's interesting how we fund this and how we, you know, what Chad described as a public-private partnership, which VHFA does, is sort of one piece of the public-private partnership of this. It's like how the money is raised is a public-private partnership, right? Is like how the tax credits are sold to banks to make money available to build housing is a public-private partnership. But one thing that we haven't been doing as much in Vermont, I think we're starting to talk about in a much more robust way, is the public-private partnership of building. Mm -hmm. um, Mm -hmm. housing. And I think that's something that has such different dynamics in different areas of the state that it becomes harder to have a statewide conversation about what's possible. Mm -hmm. And from where you sit in the, in the house, Emily, what are some of the different either points that are being raised, concerns that are being raised, stories you're hearing? Well, so my favorite dynamic 
um, which is like a little deep geek, but we're in the right place for that. Plus we're on like what minute 45, like, you know, only very certain people are still listening. (laughs) (laughs) Only the stalwarts is still sticking around here. (laughs) It's really a tension around how much accountability can we require of the private sector if they are taking Mm. dollars, right? And oh, so yes, yes, yes. The tension is always, you know, VHCB has this core mission around their housing piece, which is perpetually affordable housing, right? And it's because it's public dollars, so it should be perpetually publicly, a, create a perpetual public good, right? That's sort of the bargain that they've struck. And if there was an unlimited quantity of the money in the universe, then, you know, sprinkle it all about. But given that's a limited quantity, they would rather put it towards perpetually affordable rather than temporarily affordable because that will have longer term, you know, public good for the money. But of course, I think everyone agrees, including VHCB, that we need to have a mix of housing in our communities built in various ways by various people for various people at various income levels with various abilities, blah, blah, blah. And so then the question is like, what is the state's responsibility with regard to private sector investment in something that we all agree is on some level of public good, which is just housing of any kind is a public good, mm-hmm. right? And what is an individual's responsibility towards that public good, whether they are a property owner who's living on their property or, or a property owner that's not living on their property? And if they're getting public dollars, does that responsibility increase or does just the provision of housing itself be a public good? And that's sort of like, I think where some of the, a lot of the tension really shakes out here is sort of how long, you know, yesterday um, afternoon, I went into this um, newer restaurant in Brattleboro, which I, is it called the station? I like can't even remember what it's called. The new, the place that used to be the River Garden all of a sudden. Oh, what are they calling it now? The Whetstone Station? Whetstone? The, the place on the river is called the Whetstone Station. Anyway, that place. Yeah. where the Obviously, I, I haven't been there in a while, so yes. <laughs> I'm so sorry. No I'm offense sorry to, to... I'm to apologizing people to hard. people who have worked so hard to build it and run it that I don't remember the name of the restaurant right now. But anyway, and I was on the back patio, which is a lovely place, sitting with a friend who I used to sit on the back patio of the River Garden with, which was a publicly funded public space that then mm-hmm. became a publicly funded nonprofit space, but still publicly available and accessible. And we'd sat in that exact same patio dozens and dozens of times together, chatting and drinking some sort of liquid and whatever. And now it is a private space that's only accessible if I buy a cocktail, right? And I'm really glad it's there. And it was a lovely drink and it was a lovely environment. And it, you know, it's all very nice. But it's a question of like those public dollars, like they just dissolved in a poof. They had a limited shelf life um, towards sort of the public provision of services. And that's, yeah, that's the tension that we're all stuck in, I think. Well, I I echo that tension um, from a slightly different angle, Emily, as a reporter, quite often when you would be trying to follow these public dollars and account to do your, do your watchdogging as you're supposed to do as a, as a um, reporter, how often these public dollars would just disappear into organizations um, and you weren't necessarily allowed to follow them because they were now in um, a private organization. Um, So slightly different perspective, but I I hear that tension. And then I also sort of the other side of the tension, because I, you know, I think I've sounded as if I feel very clear about this, that like public dollars. No, it's, it's not clear. It's not clear. The other side of it that I also agree with is like, we have a profound market failure. Um, Mm -hmm. You know, I think real estate in most places, most of the time is a mark, you know, is it's not something that can be done perfectly by the market. And even when we look at times of great real estate booms, those were almost entirely driven by public sector engagement, like, you know, say the fifties with lots of public sector failures, like redlining attached to that, right? Mm -hmm. So I don't know, you know, the government's responsibility to intervene in a market, an imperfect market to perhaps create something more perfect. 
um, again, continuing tension. And I think a really good example of that um, is the case of Grafton, Vermont. Ooh. Adorable town. Every tourist dream. When people imagine the joys of Act 250 and this precious Vermont that we have carved out of the harsh granite and tree filled mountains of Vermont, we imagine a place like Grafton, right? But the entire town is owned by a nonprofit. Like, what is happening? And like, I love it there. It's lovely. I love the cheese. I've stayed at the inn. I've gone to a bunch of conferences there. I like, I know a lot of nice people who live there, but like, that is so weird. And are we expecting mm -hmm. like the whole state to be like that? Is that our goal? What is happening? Well, in the story of Grafton, <laughs> at least the popular story that gets told is the nonprofit saved it. Yeah, it was a dying town, and without the nonprofit, it would not be what it is today. Yes, but what would it be? And how many towns do we want to be owned by nonprofits? Maybe all of them. Maybe that's perfect. I really have no idea. It's just like such an object lesson, but I'm not sure what the lesson is. Chad, what, what are you your thoughts, Chad? <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure I can speak to the the specificness of Grafton, it, although it is lovely. It's, so I'm, it's I'm just using it as an object lesson. I hope no one from Grafton, you it's know, been, really it's been I have some Grafton cheddar there. in the fridge. Yes, yeah. <laughs> um, I think it speaks to a couple of things. One, you know, my colleague Seth Leonard, you know, has spent some time going around uh, to different communities uh, talking about. Um, essentially kind of what is it, you know, what community do you want to be? You know, how do you mm -hmm. want to see the, uh, how you invest in your community? How do you want to see that reflected in who you are? And I think that's a really important question for individual communities to do, but for us collectively going to Emily's point around, you know, how we invest in, um, in communities, it, it really should be driven by what, you know, what do we want to look like? Who do we want to be as a community? And that might look like different things to, to different folks, but we want to make sure that there's equity in um, how we make those decisions and there's accountability to how mm -hmm. we spend those public dollars and ensuring that folks are getting their needs met um, when, when we do make those investments. So Chad, I think- yeah. I have a question about what you just said. Yeah. How do we have equity in the public decisions that we make in a participatory, small town democracy where only certain people show up at the meetings right and like a lot of this depends on oh wow we can go off on a whole tangent <laughs> right now um but uh to bring like it back what that's like you know the drb process all of it is all just like driven by or they, they been... not in every community but they run the risk of being driven by just a handful of people who show up mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I think we have, uh, as a state, there's a lot of values that we've really held up, right, um, as, uh, as uh, quintessential Vermont. Um, and, I, uh, and, and I'll say that I think we're, again, coming back to this term of existential, I think we're really grappling with that right now as we see the disparities of who has access to home ownership. When you know at this point the the median price to build a home is five hundred and fifty thousand, median price to buy a home is almost four hundred thousand. So we're really looking at uh, some dramatic inequities in order to own a home. Um, and you often think of like who shows up, who's able to show up to those decision making bodies, and it's oftentimes homeowners mm -hmm. um, and who have access um, and. Uh, may have the financial well-being to be able to uh, participate in those. Um, and that oftentimes, because housing is seen as a tool of wealth generation and wealth accumulation and passing that on to the next generation, um, we want to hold on to that asset, that investment. And so I think that does really, you know, um, uh, pose a question in terms of like how, where do we see housing in this spectrum of uh, what does our community look like and how do we make decisions to ensure that everyone has the housing that we need and, 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 and deserve and, and have the right to and be able to participate in a way to that can allow for change, that can allow for things to, to uh, evolve um, as our world evolves. And, you know, I think 
I'm going to be super awkward and trying to bring it back to S100. I know, I was just thinking that. I think the core zoning piece of S100 actually is that. Yes, I I do. I do think that the the brilliance of S100 is that it does wrestle with some of these questions around um, the zoning ordinances that we have at the municipal level and the state level can play a role, can be levers in how do we make decisions and what our community looks like. And if we level set our municipal ordinances and have some, I think this is important to have some uh, change in our state policy, we'll be able to make those decisions in a more equitable way. Thank you. Um, We have, again, time is running out and I wanna give Chad a minute. You had mentioned some programs that you had wanted to outline for folks. I just wanna make sure you had time to do that. Yeah, yeah. So um, uh, while a a lot of the focus has been on the zoning, um, there's a a handful of programs that are being proposed um, in in this bill. Um, And so a number of them, um, uh, the Senate version, it's it's kind of a strange uh, 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 practice that they have, but that's the practice the Senate has, is they take all of the programs and the dollars out. Um, of the policy bills, and they hold on to them as they're working through uh, the magic that they do to build the budget. Um, and so uh, the bill as it passed the Senate didn't have those investments in it. But the House version is now has uh, investments in the Vermont Housing Improvement Program, the or Vermont Rental Housing Improvement Program, which has been a very successful way to get dollars into housing that is on the verge of um, becoming un- uninhabitable. Mm-hmm. Um, it's uh, run through, the, it's administered through the Department of Housing and Community Development, and it's uh, then um, the investments go to the five, um, our, our community or nonprofit community housing organization. So Wyndham and Windsor Housing Trust operates that um, in, in the Wyndham County region. And I, I'll have to say it's an extremely successful and important program. Um, there's also a couple of programs um, around eviction, re- uh, eviction rescue program, um, which uh, would essentially kind of uh, prevent evictions from happening and provide some resources for folks um, so that folks do not become homeless. Um, there's a couple of programs um, that are currently being operated by VHFA, uh, the First Generation Home Buyer Program, um, which essentially gets dollars, grant dollars into the hands of folks who are first generation uh, home buyers, and we've really prioritized the bill um, passed last year. We've got a million dollars. We've been able to get um, six folks um, who are first time home buyers, first generation home buyers in homes. We've got 23 on the way. So there's additional dollars for that. Um, we've also got a um, revolving loan uh, rental um, program. Essentially, this is kind of a new program uh, that would. Um, address some of the market failures uh, to getting dollars into the hands of small developers who would like to get new rental units online, but don't have the access to the capital. Uh, So this would provide a subsidy for those developers. Um, Mm -hmm. VHCB um, is also in the house bill that just just moved. Um, There's a $50 million investment to continue, as Emily was talking about, perpetually affordable um, affordable housing uh, development across the state. Um, And those often, those go through our our nonprofit um, housing um, um, programs across the state. Um, There's also a missing middle homeownership program, which VHFA administers. Um, Last month, we uh, actually administered last year's uh, allotment of $14.2 million. We'll be um, doing um, another $9 million in the coming months. This bill proposes that we continue that program and invest another $20 million in that. And essentially what that does is it invests, um, uh, provides subsidies to developers to be able to make um, uh, uh, essentially starter homes, affordable mm-hmm. starter homes. As I was saying before, it, it costs $550,000 right now is the median cost to build a home in Vermont. And so we're it's trying not to- It's starter. <laughs> yeah, I know. It's not a starter. It's, you know, it's not, that's not even possible for our family. Um, and most families in Vermont, it's not. Um, and so uh, that program um, is partnering with, again, the nonprofits. There's a 
at least a third of those dollars have to go to shared equity, which are perpetually affordable um, housing investments. Um, so there's a lot of amazing programming and dollars being proposed in this bill. Um, again, the idea is to marry to to bring to bring those um, the the dollars and the the policy together so that we're making sure that the best use of those dollars are are, are being uh, utilized. Thank you, Chad. Thank you so much. Um, and folks can go to your website to learn more. Will you remind them what that is? Sure. Our website is vhfa.org. Um, and one website that uh, you can also get to from our, our vhfa.org is housingdata.org. So um, awesome. we uh, want to make sure that we're making these decisions using data and stories as, as, as best we can. So um, housingdata.org is a really great resource, resource for, uh, um, for communities to utilize. Chad, thank you so much. Hey, Emily, if people want to learn more about you, how can they do that? Folks can go to emilykornheiser.org and you will find links to all the ways to get in touch as well as my newsletter, social media, all the fun things. Thank you. And we haven't done this in a while, but since I poured, made myself a, a mocktail, we're going to toast. And I'm going to toast to little moments of inspiration because at least our YouTube viewers can see over Chad's shoulder, this beautiful hand, child drawn, I love you sign, which has just brought me so much joy through this entire conversation. So here's two little moments of inspiration and joy. Thank you. Mm, thank you. We'll see everybody at, on WVEW 107.7 LP Brattleboro, your community radio station next week. Have a good weekend, everyone.